Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists predictably got it absolutely correct. And today, this being, oh gosh, the what middle of the month already, middle of January, we're halfway through it. It's, it's amazing. And yes, I still am Tom Novolis, your host, and delighted that you're all joining me again this week. I posed the question in the promo that's over my shoulder at SamuelAdamsReturns.net about destroying democracy. <clears throat> I mean, should we do it? Should, should we destroy democracy? And the question arises because what we're hearing out there, especially from the Democrats, is the idea that Anyone that believes in the Constitution, the uh, Republicans, and even the Republicans as part of the Republicans, are destroying democracy. I mean, let's face it, you probably saw in the media, they brought up, I think Tucker Carlson even brought it up this week, where uh, uh, Uncle Joe, uh, he took and he did what? Had the Justice Department, or more likely, O'Biden, being Obama, O'Biden, because Obama's really running things. So we got O'Biden, Uncle Joe, and I'm going to give you some interesting quotes from Uncle Joe here in a little bit. But uh, Uncle Joe has the Justice Department standing up a group on domestic terrorism where it is specifically pointed at all of those that will not bow down to government authority or question the government. That definitely sounds like Uncle Joe uh, and those that preceded him. Uncle Joe, who's Uncle Joe? Well, you know what? I want to talk to you first off before I get into our founders and what they debated in relationship to democracy and why I'm going to make this statement very clear without question. And this is based on every aspect of foundational history is, should we kill democracy? And the answer is yes. Did I say that loud enough? Should we kill democracy? The answer is yes. And I'm going to tell you why. So I'm going to give you some quotes and, and, uh, I'm going to take you through these quotes, and after I go through these first initial quotes of a modern writer, more or less, that you'll begin to understand. And then as I get into the founder's perspective, both the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist, I'm going to give you both, and watch what I'm doing with my hands for those that are watching the video, is my left hand and my right hand, right hand and left hand, will make some sense as I go through these initial quotes. And then I'm going to give you some quotes from Uncle Joe. And those that are over 50, maybe, know Uncle Joe, clearly. So initially, we go with this one. How about this? Just th This is from one particular person. Democracy is the road to socialism. Gosh, we've been talking about the Democrat Party for how long now, and especially on this program, that they're clearly socialist, if not blatantly communist, especially the progressive portions of it, and now the AOC crowd, and now Schumer is truly a communist, and everything that he's promoting, because he has gone that far over. But let's get it clear. And remember, O'Biden oh, and all of the Democrats, with all these voting bills, want democracy to prevail. Democracy, this author says, is the road to socialism. This particular author continues to say, and this author not being me, but the one that I'm referring to, continues to say is that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle for democracy. 
So what we saw, and you can use AOC as the prime, all of us are communist. That's AOC stands for all of us are communists. I know the U is out of there, but you can slip it in. I mean, they can do that. So you got a bartender that takes and gets into the ruling class, and they're winning for democracy. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Oh, here's one for the Fauci's, the NIH, the whole idea of uh, what Fauci talks about in relationship to science. And as I've talked about on other programs, is science as the new religion. And those that are out there, like Fauci, are the high priest of it, and you have all of this other stuff. But here's, here's an interesting quote. It goes like this. Science and democracy are the right and left hands. So when you saw me doing the right and left hand, you have science and democracy are the right and left hands of what I'll refer to as the move from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. Wow. That's almost what we heard Fauci talking about. That's what we hear all of these bureaucrats and the Obamaites saying, well, follow the science. We got to keep the democracy going. And if you don't get the jab, how are we going to sustain our democracy? You know that all these unvaxxed people are, are worse than the terrorists that are out there, worse than even global warming. Well, I guess I wouldn't go that far because that's science in their minds. Hmm. Interesting. Here's one that doesn't use the term democracy specifically, but it happens that society is saved as often as the circle of its ruling class is narrowed. Ooh, what are we doing with this election bills? Narrowing the ruling class. And the Anti-Federalists talk about that. Very interesting. And we'll get to that somewhere during the program. Every demand for the most simple bourgeoisie financial reform, for the most ordinary liberalism, for the most commonplace republicanism, for the flattest democracy is forthwith punished as an assault upon society and is branded as socialism. Hmm. Wow. Wow. And you have to remember, I do have these quotes and the reference to at least the references to the quotes at the posting for today's program at SamuelAdamsReturns.net. Now, let's continue. Just, just a couple more here with this author. And if you haven't figured out who this author is, this one will virtually give it away. It would perhaps be as well if things were to remain quiet for a few years yet, so that all this 1848 democracy has time to rot away. Hmm. All forms of the state have democracy for their truth, and for that reason are false to the extent that they are not democracy. Huh? Isn't that a little, like, doublespeak? Well, that's what you would expect. These quotes, if you have not already guessed, especially by the last one, is 1848 is when what? What was written in 1848 and by who? Well, none other than, yes, it was the Communist Manifesto and it was Karl Marx. So all these quotes that I just gave you on socialism are from Karl Marx. All right. We have time here. Let's go talk about Uncle Joe. What did Uncle Joe have to say? Well, I think you're going to find some of these very interesting, and in particular, the first one uh, that I want to say, or actually take you through. Let's see. Here we go. This one is very, very pertinent to everything that is going on right now. And it's not specific to democracy, but Uncle Joe he said or wrote this. 
It is enough that people know there was an election. The people who cast the vote decide nothing. The people who count the votes decides everything. All right, I'm going to reveal Uncle Joe straight up. As I said, those over 50 may know who Uncle Joe is. Us that are much older than that clearly know who Uncle Joe is. And we're not talking about Uncle Joe o Biden. We're talking about Joe Stalin. He was called Uncle Joe. And is this not specific to what happened in our last national election for president. It's, it is enough that the people know there was an election. The people who cast the votes decide nothing. The people who count the votes decide everything. So once again, when we're looking at all of these voter bills that are in the federal government, we're going to talk about that in the next couple of segments because there were great concerns and issues relative to the power given to the House of Representatives and Congress in general that the Anti-Federalists brought up very clearly and predicted exactly where we are today. They predicted it very exactly and what could happen. Here's a couple more that I think are very interesting and should be taken into consideration. Education is a weapon whose effects depend on who holds it in his hands and at whom it is aimed. That's about education. You know, we, we look at that. We always said that the teachers' unions and all of that are definitely servants of communism, socialism in the little bit, but communism in total, and that's what we have. Who holds it? Who runs it all? Joseph Stalin. Now here's one that I think kind of sums up what we're talking about with these particular individuals, and I want you to grab this one. I'm going to say it very slowly, but this is the culmination of everything around democracy and everything that is happening in our modern time around democracy. Here it is. Communism needs democracy like the human body needs oxygen. Are you getting that? Communism needs democracy like the human body needs oxygen. So everything you have, even the Republicans, Republicans, all of those who you think are conservatives that are talking about democracy, and you'll see as we get into it, and the references are there, both from the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist, is that Democracy is the destruction of liberty. It destroys it. But here, communism cannot survive without it. As we're finishing up this last minute or so, let, let me drive that one home again. And this is Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky quotes, this is his quote. This is what he said. Communism needs democracy like the human body needs oxygen. Well, they're out to kill all of us humans. They're out to put us into whatever that the O'Biden administration is contriving in their sick, perverted communist minds around all of us that believe in constitutionalism, that believe in God, that believe in the order and rule of law based on foundational truths and, first off, biblical truth. But communism, it needs democracy. So I guess what we need to do, if you're going to be active, and what Sam Adams and others said, is we need to cut off the oxygen to democracy. 
So come on back in the next segment as we talk about that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they were predictably, predictively correct. And as I finished up the last segment, we were talking about the need to kill the whole idea, especially in our modern political sense, that of democracy. Excuse me. And in killing that democracy, let's go back first off to looking at none other than Webster's 1828 dictionary so that we really understand the term. Because what is used um, in our modern time, in particular in the political class, and once again, this is with conservatives, this is with all the different pundits out there, the Hannity, Schmanities, just about 90% of everybody on talk radio, TV, use democracy as a definition for our constitutional republic. And I want to just draw it back first off. Let's look at Webster's Dictionary. And democracy, as it's defined, is people and to possess, to govern. Government by the people. A form of government in which the supreme power is lodged in the hands of the people collectively, or in which the people exercise the powers of legislation. Such was the government of Athens. Now, this is real critical to understand. We know from a uh, as, as it's happened in our modern time from a philosophical perspective, we're going, we the people, we're the government. We take that right out of none other than the preamble, right? We the people, we the people, we the people. Yet, let, let's really get to the uh, specifics. Let's get to the very local components because Sam Adams he clearly defined, and I, the references are there, SamuelAdamsReturns.net. He clearly defined that all government was local and that it was about local participation in local government. And how that worked, that came from a philosophical, a very clear mechanism that I've talked to you about over these number of years that we've been doing this program together. And that goes to that which was part of the culture of old England called the folk molt. The folk molt was that every citizen was mandated to show up at a town meeting, and I always say, because I quote this from the historical writings, even the village idiot. Well, <laughs> in our cases here in America, even as, you know, we can go back to some of the quotes of Uncle Joe, which I won't, is that, uh, you know, people are given too much leeway and the idiots out there, and Uncle Joe talked about the idiots, you know, they take too much as well. But at least in the folk mult, Everyone had a voice and was required to participate. And that was the culmination and definition of none other than democracy, because they were all not only to have a voice, but they were all to participate in the decision process. Now, the last time we heard anything about that, you know, on a national basis was when, uh, oh gosh, all of a sudden I can't think of his name, maybe I will later, but the multimillionaire computer science guy that uh, was, ran for president from Tel oh, Ross Perot, see, I, I described somebody, I knew I'd eventually get to it, Ross Perot, where he was talking about everybody, you know, being able to vote on your, compute, on your computer or on your TV or you know, somehow on your phone, electrically, electronically, that you would be able to vote and we would have a national democracy. Well, I got a real problem with all of that, and, and here's why. So how many of you actually go to your city council meetings? 
I mean, that's the closest form of ability for you to voice your voice, your opinions, your thoughts. Well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You elected those people to be on the city council, so now we have representation, and that becomes representative based on the various what contracts that we have under constitutionalism within your state. Hmm. Let's think of something else a little bit closer. Uh, how many of you are members of some organization? Church, a club, a gun club, uh, let's see, you know, some people, whatever the name of your organization is that you happen to be a member of, and actually go and participate because you have a voice and a vote in that. I mean, there's some of the organizations that I belong to. I don't participate. And I admit it. And there's a lot of different reasons why I don't. And you ask, well, why are you still a member of the organization? A lot of them I'm not. A couple of them I am because I'm life members. For instance, the VFW, I'm a life member of the VFW. So, you know, I, I, my membership is never going to go away. But that doesn't mean I show up for all the various meetings, even though I have a voice. So that's local democracy in things like that. How many of you show up to your school board meetings? Well, wait a minute. If you show up to school board meeting and you have a different opinion, then, as I noted in the first segment, you're going to have the FBI and the DOJ coming after you because you're going to be known as a domestic terrorist. And if you voice opinions different than those you elected to represent your opinion, well, let's face it, they don't give a rip about your thoughts or opinions because they don't come back out and talk to you. So that became extremely problematic from the whole perspective of the anti-federalist in particular. When we look at that, now, we're going to spend these na next number of minutes in trying to review some of that. And, and pointedly, there's a lot of information in respect to elections and representation. One of the great anti-federalists that I love, not only would it be Mr. Yates, but Richard Henry Lee. And he is under the pseudonym of the federal farmer. Now, I am referring in particular today to Anti-Federalist number 55 in these Anti-Federalist papers. And again, the reference is there. It's the, the, the special edition of the Anti-Federalist papers. And when you pull up that PDF in your PDF reader, and at this particular time I'm using Acrobat, I like the search engine in there, type in democracy. And you will get down to what none other than Mr. Richard Henry Lee has to say in particular, or just go to anti federalist number 55, which is subtitled, Will the House of Representatives be genuinely representative? Can it be so? So he just opens up, and I'm going to go with the opening on it. In viewing the various government governments instituted by mankind, we see their whole force reducible to two principles, the important springs which alone move the machines and give them their intended influence and control, are force and persuasion. By the former men are compelled, by the latter they are drawn. We denominate a government's despotic or free as the one or the other principle prevails. Perhaps it is not possible for a government to be so despotic as not to operate persuasively on some of its subjects. Nor is it, in the nature of things, I conceive, for a government to be so free or so supported by voluntary consent as never to want force to compel obedience to the laws. In despotic governments, one man or a few men, independent of the people, generally make the laws, command obedience, and enforce it by the sword. 
I'm going to leave it off right there because we have so much to cover in here. But when you start going through this, here's something that I opened the newsletter with, if you will. And this is what Richard Henry Lee writes. I repeat my observations that the plan proposed, and that being the Constitution, will have a doubtful operation between the two principles, and whether it will be predominant towards persuasion or force is uncertain. And a lot of that depends, as we're seeing right now, who is in power, as well as what we've seen is the bureaucrats that should never be there have come to power. Henry Lee continues, government must exist. If the persuasive principles are feeble, force is infallibly the next resort. The moment the laws of Congress shall be disregarded, they must languish and the whole system be convulsed. That moment, we must have a resource to this next resort and all freedom vanishes. He also gets down into it here and talks about it as well as others that we don't have proper representation from a democratic point of view. Because where is it that the people will take and show up to really make the unified decisions? Where is it that you're going to have a vote of the people? As we look into the history of all things, and we talk about it from the Federalist perspective, which we're going to look at Federalist number 10 and Federalist number 11, we know that democracy breaks down to anarchy, despotism. And as we know, democracy now is the oxygen that gives communism its life. So representation is something that's very important. And as I've talked about in other programs in the past, is that we do not have proper representation in the House of Representatives. How is it that one person can represent 800,000 to 1.2 million people? How is that? I mean, they argued about it here it, it, at this point in time, in what those numbers were and what the references were in respect to uh, how many? 35,000? 65,000? For one representative? Yet, when we start getting into millions, hundreds of thousands, I mean, yeah, you write a letter, you make a phone call, it is critical and important because all of these people that are flapping their jaws about democracy are nothing but a bunch of deceivers because the idea that the communists need that for their oxygen and rallying small numbers of people to take and push their ideas is truly an abuse of the whole concept of even local democracy, because not everybody's participating. For democracy to have any effect, and the closest place that it can, which is talked about in, and we'll get to it in the next segment, is in Federalists 10 and 11, is that it has to be close to the people. And all the people have to participate. Now, if you can't participate even in your local club and you're not participating at your city council, county council, any type of board meetings that are relative, not even in your school board meeting, then you have to depend on a representative form of government. And it falls within that larger scope of federalism as it works up from local government county government, state government, to federal government, all within a framework of law that is defined within your constitutions, be it state and or federal. Sam Adams, the anti-federalists, understood this. Even the federalists were very, very clear that democracy does not work and should not be a part 
of Americans' political system. Come on back as we touch on more. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this last segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, again, predictably profound and correct. Now, I have the references in relationship to the question and those uh, in areas that didn't get the second segment, you need to go listen to that as well. Because as from the first segment, I ended that very simply. Should we kill democracy? Should we stop it? Should we just put a big major hold on it? I mean, you're hearing O'Biden in his speech in Georgia this past week saying that all of us that are constitutionalists, all of us that really believe in truth and foundational truth, and even the Republicans and Republicans and those conservatives who use the word democracy, O'Biden was saying that they're out to destroy democracy. Yeah, absolutely. We need to destroy democracy in America because our Constitution is a republic. It is a representative republic. And I have to say, not only am I going to talk from Federalist 10 and 11, but from Federalist 14 right now, I want to just bring this to you, is that uh, as this writer was talking about, is that the air which limits Republican government to its narrow district has been unfolded and refuted in preceding papers. I remark here only that it seems to owe its rise and prevalence chiefly to the confounding of a republic with a democracy. Gee, that, we're, we're, hold on. This was Federalist 14. And even right now, it's confounding, it's confusing that we have the President of the United States, O'Biden, talking about democracy, when in fact, we're a republic. And applying the former reasoning drawn from the nature of the latter. Wait a minute, isn't that a spin? To, let's see, what do we, wait, 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 we're taking the former and reasoning and drawing that and applying it to the latter, that means you're mixing terminology and definitions to cross one over the other. The true distinction between these forms, here's foundational truth, if you can handle it. The true distinction between these forms was also adverted to on former occasion. It is, comma, that in a democracy, the people meet and exercise government in person. So that goes to what I was talking about in the last segment. If you believe that you live in a democracy, then you don't need a board of supervisors. You do not need to have anybody at the school board. You don't need boards of mental health. You don't need any of that. You don't need anybody working on the finances in your city, county, in your local, whatever. You don't need any of that because you, you, my friends, are the ones that will decide. Yeah. See, the people meet and exercise government in person. In a republic, they assemble and administer it by their representatives and agents. Okay. Now, well, that kind of making sense. Where you, you go out and you elect, you determine who will represent you and act as your agent in governing. A democracy, consequently, must be confined to a small spot. A republic may be extended over a large region. It, it, it makes sense. Look, you can't even get together 
with your neighborhood association, let alone take and go make decisions for your, your city or county. Come on. You know, let's think that through. But the political class does not want to think that through. They want to take and institute what, what both Marx and Lenin talked about very clearly. And Trotsky summarized it in totality for you in that what? Communism needs democracy as the human body needs oxygen. My goodness gracious. I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's just so, so interesting. Oh, here, let's see. This one is none other than um, in Federalist number 10. Federalist number 10, we have this particular quote, is that hence it, is clear, it clearly appears that the same advantage which a republic has over a democracy in controlling the effects of faction is enjoyed by a large or small republic. So right down to your city, right down to your school board, all of that. They function as a republic, being what I just termed earlier is representative form of government. Now, he continues on in here is saying, is enjoyed by the union over the states composing it. Does this advantage consist in the substitution of representatives whose enlightened views and virtuous sentiments rendered them superior to local prejudices and to scheme of injustices? That's a question. But one of the things that we look at in relationship to all of this comes even further to a point that we'll try and finish out with the anti-federalists and what they were saying in regards to it is that you always don't have the virtuous men there. You don't even have, you know, from the pulpits, you don't even have good religion. And it doesn't matter because if you got people that are scheming, they're going to take advantage, especially within the context of a democracy. And we're seeing that all over the place. So we went through number 14. And let's see if we can kind of circle back here the uh, a little bit more. I'm sorry, I got some of these out of order. And that uh, as the natural limits of a democracy is that a distance from the central point, which will just permit the most remote citizens to assemble as often as their public functions demand and will include no greater number than can join in those functions. So the natural limit of a republic is the distance from which the center, which will barely allow the representatives of the people to meet as often as necessary for the administration of the public affairs. So it's close to home. In a democracy where a multitude of people exercise in person the legislative functions and are continually exposed by their incapacity for regular deliberation and concerted measures to the ambiguous intrigues of their executive magistrates, tyranny may well be apprehended on some favorable emergency to start up in the same quarter. So he's talking about there that, you know, you can't show up, but, you know, Joe Schmuckatelli, who you know, and you kind of, uh, I don't know about that person so much, but they're going to say, hey, you know what, this is what we need to do. And, you know, you need, you're not showing up to the meetings anyway. So, you know what, why don't you just vote the way I'm telling you how to vote and, you know, we'll take care of it for you. That's what happens in a democracy. That's what happens often, very often. So in Athens, ancient Greece city, on the plains of Attica region, north of the Gulf of Corinth, much of its early history is shrouded in myth and legend. Solon's reforms in the early part of the 6th century BC paved the way later in that century for the Clistians to establish a democratic form of government. Under this democracy, Athens flourished for the most part of the 5th century. It emerged from the Persian Wars as a dominant naval power and led on to all of these other things. But later, when you read through, it craters. It just cannot get all the people together. 
to vote, to come together on different ideas. It is said that because of all of the political reforms that Solon is often called the father of Athenian democracy. Very, very interesting. Talks about the Spanish. I mean, the, the Federalists get in here and they talk about a number of different issues relative to democracy and the failure of it. So when we come to all this voting, and we come to now all of these new ideas that O'Biden and the Democrats are trying to pass, the Anti-Federalists clearly understood it. They, they talked about it. Uh, they argued about it. They tried to counter the whole ideas of what could happen in the legislatures. So let me take a quick journey back here in some of the quotes relative to uh, anti federalist number nine, a consolidated government is a tyranny. And in here is that first, a majority of all societies consist of men who, though totally incapable of thinking, acting, uh, or acting in a governmental manner, are more readily led than driven. We have thought me to indulge them in something like a democracy in the new constitution, which part we have designated by our popular name of the House of Representatives. So as we try and understand what the uh, Federalists were trying to do and what was going on is that the shadow of uh, people's representation, that's why we see that you know, what happened on January 6th, they went to the people's house, being the house of representatives, but that is supposed to be some idea of democracy. But in fact, the body's too big. He goes on to say, but to guard against every possible danger from this lower house, we have subjected every bill that brings forward to the double negative of the upper house and the president. Nor have we allowed the populace the right to elect their representatives annually. Very important, this two-year cycle that we have now. Lest this body should be too much under the influence and control of their constituents. You know, all that it takes to elect someone, to get them into office, even on that two-year cycle, we know and thereby prove that the weatherboard of our grand edifice to show the shifting of every fashionable gale. For we have not yet learned that little else is wanting to aristocratize, aristocraticize the most democratical representative than to make him somewhat independent of his political creators. So ladies and gentlemen, we're down to the last two minutes and there, there, there's so much more in here. And what we have as you well know, is we have tyranny even in the House of Representatives because they don't represent you, and yet you're calling it a democracy. So when is the million people in my congressional district all going to show up at the Cleveland Stadium to take and talk to Dave Joyce and tell him to vote the way we want to? Well, wait a minute. First off, the Cleveland Stadium isn't going to hold a million people. I mean, you know, let's face that. So where are we all going to gather? Where are we all going to gather? Where are you going to gather in your districts, in your congressional district? So therefore, based on what the anti fellows were saying, you're not represented. And not only that, our representatives are distant from us the electorate. And not only that, they are beholden only to those special interests that either fund them or give them or they can give the political favoritism to. Very interesting. So I guess it wraps up. You're going to have to make a decision. So this year, are we going to kill democracy? And we should look at it very hard because we already talked about in democracy, as Joe Stalin said, you know, it's a big deal. You're going to vote. Who's going to count the vote? 
So it comes down to what are our elections going to be like? And are you asking for clean elections? Otherwise, guess what? Democracy is what? The oxygen of communism. Figure that one out. See you next week.